Welcome to building a virtual post-production suite with Google Cloud. My name is Adrian Graham, and I'm a cloud solutions architect for media and entertainment. And I'm also here with my colleague, Buzz Hayes, who's a global lead for industry solutions for media and entertainment. And we're going to show you a deployment today that involves content creation on the cloud. And we're going to talk about how to migrate your entire workload to the cloud to create an entire facility, a virtual facility that can span the globe. I'm also going to bring in Buzz Hayes right now to talk about some of the business use cases and some of the complexities around building this facility. Buzz? Thank you. So as you can imagine, you know, studios are under a lot of pressure these days to create content uh, under deadlines, certainly, but also with uh, significant cost constraints on it. And the quality bar keeps going up and up and up. The audience demand for quality content is going through the roof. And so we need to find ways to support anyone who's creating content with the resources they need to be able to deliver this content. Um, because we're in an increasingly globalized workforce, we're looking to try and tie together resources from all over the world, which presents its own challenges as well. And by having an inflexible infrastructure, for example, that would require people to be on-prem for any given task is really quite restrictive. So what we're looking at in the grand scheme of things is the ability to transform the infrastructure required by using what we refer to as the virtual post-production suite in this case. So by taking advantage of uh, what we know about cloud and looking at existing architectures of the way people currently do things, we can come up with optimal solutions. As you can imagine, the schedules are quite tight for delivering content these days, and resources can be very constrained for no particular reason other than you have to get a project out the door and you may not have enough compute resources, so you have to find some alternative for that. Um, because profit margins are so thin, typically on productions, there's not really much time or money available for research and development to find new ways to do things on-prem. So taking advantage of cloud is, is definitely uh, something to think about. Um, with talent shortages the way they are, talent being dispersed all over the planet, sometimes finding a way to get these people to collaborate when they're in disparate locations around the world becomes its own set of challenges. And because of the, the high cost of keeping hardware and people on-prem, there are a lot of considerations that have to be taken into account when you're trying to budget appropriately for a film again, or a TV show, especially because, again, these margins are so slow. And then one of the things that's missing from any of these uh, particular workflows is the ability to capture the actual workflow itself. So that's what we talk about when we talk about this idea of a virtual studio environment where the production company record owns all the resources required to make a production from inception all the way through the archive. And as part of that, we are archiving the workflow, which is something that's been missing up to now. So as we look forward, um, there are different applications for using cloud resources, and they apply to virtually every department on a project. So as you can imagine, when a project starts, it's typically in the business office, right, where they're starting with the, the production administration side of things. It, it eventually will step into a, a mode where you're working with artists in a previs mode, so they start to need different compute uh, resources for that. Uh, editorial is probably the longest phase of any given production, so it will start early and end last, and often is the repository of all of the visual and audio information that comes through a production. So it becomes sort of a central hub. That's a very important thing to acknowledge. Uh, visual effects, because uh, there are so many uh, visual effects artists in the world contributing to movies these days, there are assets that are all over the place that need to be centralized in order to make that a more efficient process. And then as we start to finish these things through uh, color correction and finishing, we need resources to be able to pull down these very high resolution files to be able to work on in, in real time, essentially. Uh, sound post-production is another area where we can take advantage of cloud and certainly the mastering and the versioning. Uh, there are so many different versions of any given title these days. It's important to leverage as many parallel resources as possible. Again, a great use of cloud. So when we talk about provisioning uh, a studio or in this case, a virtual post-production suite in the cloud, it starts with workstations. Those workstations can have very different tasks some can be just spreadsheets for handling budgets and schedules. Others start to use visual tools. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about some creative visual tools. Uh, and then once you start bringing the editorial component, you have editing uh, software, you have all these visual and audio assets that have to be maintained. Um, so that requires a lot of storage. Um, renders uh, come from all different places. There are transcodes that are just a way to get stuff into the right form to work with. But then there's also all the visual effects rendering. So we need an infrastructure that's scalable for that. 
Uh, we also need to be able to control where all these assets are, where they live and who they belong to, who has permission for these things. So centralizing asset management means that essentially you have a single source of truth in cloud where no one who isn't supposed to have access has access and everyone who is supposed to have access has the proper access, but the management of those assets is centralized. And finally, we deal with the archive as something from the very beginning of a project where we want to make sure that we know when assets are created, where do they belong in the grand scheme of things, ending up with the archive so that any part of the process, including the workflow, can be recreated. Now, as we look at the different types of uh, uh, resources available to folks to use, we really have to think about the people, the teams that are working with this stuff. So it's important to build virtual workstations that that serve the need of the artist that's using this particular workstation. We need to be able to then deliver these workstations to wherever the people happen to be in the world. And as part of that, we need to orchestrate how all these things talk to each other, the networking involved, the security involved, the storage, all of that, especially when these uh, resources are sprinkled across the planet. So we need uh, re reliable storage. We need the ability to scale up render resources as we need them, and we shouldn't have to pay for them if we're not using them. And we need the ability to archive this entire infrastructure at the end of a production. So the way we look at this is kind of in two different skews. One is more the enterprise level, where we're talking about uh, companies that may have a number of editing suites. Each suite is assigned a given production, and those assets are then deployed to that particular suite, but they come from a common set. You can think of broadcasters as a good example of this. But there are other more siloed productions where a feature film or an independent production uh, doesn't need access to any resources from any other projects. They only require their own. So this idea of a virtual post-production suite and a virtual studio applies to either of these two situations. Now, as we look at how we connect to all of these uh, folks from around the world and all these resources, uh, it's important to know that Google is a private network. So if you have all of these people and resources that need access to their materials, they're all on the same network, no matter where they happen to be in on the planet. And that's a really important consideration. It's as if they're all in a very large building together and they have access to the resources they need. Now, security is something that always uh, has to be mentioned when it comes to any form of cloud, uh, whether it's compute or storage. But when it comes to the media industry, they're very sensitive, obviously, to uh, the security aspects of the media. So we take that very seriously. We're part of all the major industry organizations. We're part of the Trusted Partner Network. We work with the ISC uh, and the Motion Picture Association of America. We go through regular audits. We really understand that security is paramount in, in terms of how these productions get done and the level of secrecy involved in keeping these things under wraps until such time as they, they make it out to the world. So we take this idea of security extremely seriously, and we have a number of rendering workloads solutions that you can find uh, on the Google website that would help point you in the right direction. But again, we, we take security very, very seriously, especially when we start to distribute uh, the, the resources around the world. So with that, I would like to turn this over to Adrian, who's going to talk a little bit about a specific implementation of the virtual post-production suite and how all the pieces fit together. Adrian? Thanks, Buzz. Um, I'm going to take us through uh, an example architecture of what a virtual post-production suite might, some of the components that it's built out of. Um, and then we're going to show, uh, show one in, uh, in action. Uh, but I want to start by talking about how to gain access to our, uh, to our resources. And you could do that from any type of workstation or laptop or some sort of a, a hardware client or a thin client. Uh, and this could be a Windows, Mac, Linux, Chrome OS device. Uh, it doesn't matter because you're just viewing pixels and the pixels are streaming uh, in a particular format. We'll talk about that in a second. But to get into our network, to get into Google Cloud Platform, you want to be able to securely connect to the resources. And to do that, we're using what's called a connection broker. And the connection broker is very important because it serves two main purposes. Number one, it authenticates the user. It provides connectivity to an, uh, to an identity service such as uh, IAP with G Suite uh, or some sort of Active Directory service. And it can also drive things like multi-factor authentication to send a push notification, for example, to a mobile device uh, to authenticate a user. And the other main function that it, that it performs, uh, the connection broker performs, is matching users to resources. So when resources are assigned to a user, the connection broker authenticates and will connect the user to their virtual workstation. Now, 
what this diagram does not show are different regions around the world. And you could have artists working in, uh, in Los Angeles like me or in, uh, in Europe or in Tokyo or anywhere in the world that there's a Google data center and run your virtual workstations and connect those connect artists in those locations to the virtual workstations. You heard Buzz earlier sp uh, speak about regionality of where artists, uh, you wanna go where the artists are and take advantage of things like production tax credits, for example. Um, you wanna be able to spin up a studio uh, where those production tax credits uh, or the artist pools are available. Uh, and you can do that by deploying resources there and putting a connection broker there. Now, once you're on uh, your virtual workstation, you have access to all the typical things that you would enjoy with uh, a, a machine that's under your desk or, or at work or at home. And you've got things like shared file systems that can be mounted as either Samba or NFS. Um, and uh, because they're shared, they are available for read write to all users in the project. Um, users in different regions, there's strategies for synchronizing the data between shared file systems. Uh, so there's some patterns around that. You also have connectivity to things like asset management databases um, so that you could centrally store and manage your assets and do things like metadata tagging on them and bring the, uh, the, the software that you typically use on-prem, you could bring that into the cloud to provide asset management. So you again, you're providing your artists with a familiar environment that they should be indistinguishable from your on-prem. Uh, and finally, there's strategies around archiving and storage um, to be able to offline, for example, shots that uh, final shots, um, or to be able to move data around uh, around a network, um, there are some storage uh, strategies in which you use object data or object storage as uh, not as archive, but as a backend for uh, for a different shared file system. Uh, we could talk about some of that. Uh, we talk about a little bit of that in the demo. Um, but before we jump into the demo, I want to talk about the technology that we're using to stream the, the, the remote desktop to the endpoint, to our, our client. And for that, we've chosen a technology called PC over IP by a company called Teradici. Now, there's a lot of different uh, streaming technologies out there. There's a lot of different protocols out there. But we, uh, we've uh, chosen PC over IP because it provides the highest image fidelity in that it can display uh, lossless pixels. It can re accurately represent what the remote machine is providing uh, on your client. So uh, it has this uh, thing called resolve to lossless or build to lossless, which will provide you an uncompressed view of the pixels on your screen. Um, and then it has the ability to stream, th for example, uh, moving video in a different codec uh, in different parts of the screen. It also supports things like high resolution monitors, 4K uh, and above monitors, um, as well as arbitrary screen resolutions, which is really important. Some artists have a 2K monitor in front of them and then an HD monitor, a smaller HD monitor uh, as sort of a, an accessory monitor. Uh, Teradici can span multiple monitors and, uh, and, and drive both of those at independent resolutions, as well as independent frame rates as well, up to 60 frames per second, for example. It's also very flexible when it comes to bandwidth consumption. So you, um, you can run Teradici PC over IP over, uh, over a very uh, a small amount of bandwidth if you've got a, a, a minimal internet at home or via, uh, via a phone hotspot or Wi-Fi. Uh, and then when you're in the, uh, in the office or if you're at home with uh, gig internet, you can take advantage of, of all that bandwidth and get even higher quality. Uh, but it's totally adaptable and has the ability to lock um, to, to, to do AV sync and audio sync. You'll see that as part of the demo. And finally, uh, it's highly secure in that it's only transmit, transmitting pixels, not your data. Uh, and those pixels are encrypted as well. Um, another important point I want to, uh, uh, I can't stress enough, is that Teradici Peace Over IP supports more than just keyboard and mouse. It supports things, uh, other input devices, such as this Wacom Cintiq tablet. Um, that you're going to see me draw directly on and demo and it is able to connect that directly to my client that goes streams directly into my virtual workstation so with that let's take a look at how uh, our workflow would look during the demo so here we are on my mac desktop and i'm going to log into my virtual workstation using uh, the pc over ip client from teradici this is a, a free download from teradici.com uh, it runs on Mac, Windows, Linux, Chrome OS, uh, and it is a software client. There's also hardware clients. Uh, you could use what's called a zero client or a thin client to connect. And you can connect in a few different ways, um, depending on how you set it up. 
we've set this up not to connect to an IP address, but to a fully qualified domain name. And our domain that we're using Cloud DNS through is editdemo.cloudmediasolutions.dev. And the login flow, uh, like we saw in the diagram, will look up my, uh, will authenticate me through the Active Directory service. So I'm going to log in using my Adrian Demo account. And it's going to authenticate me uh, using multi-factor authentication. So we have a, a Radius Duo server set up in our project as well. And I can either get a passcode from Google Authenticator, uh, or I can set up push notifications, which I've set up, which is pretty neat. So I click send me a push, and on my phone, I click yes, it's me. And I'm authenticated into the Cloud Access Manager environment. The Cloud Access Manager looks up what desktops or resources are assigned to my user. And I've got these three resources assigned to me. They're uh, virtual workstations. Uh, one is a virtual workstation in Los Angeles. Another one is in a different region. This one happens to be in Tokyo. And another uh, virtual workstation in Los Angeles, that's my media encoder uh, worker uh, utility node. So I'm gonna connect to my virtual workstation now. And because I've been authenticated through the Active Directory service, all of my user permissions are going to be matched to that uh, user identity in Windows. So once logged into my workstation, I can see that this is just a standard Windows workstation running Windows Server 2019, which includes Windows Server, uh, sorry, Windows Desktop Experience, which gives me the equivalent of Windows 10. And on this uh, Windows workstation, I've got mounted a cloud volume, a NetApp cloud volume, and that's mounted to the P drive. P stands for projects. And this is a standard uh, POSIX file system that's mounted under SMB. And because it's mounted under Samba, you get all the standard permissions that you would uh, with Active Directory assignments and files that I create uh, as me, as my user, will be written as me. Uh, it is also a shared file system so that any other user on another workstation or on a different server uh, Windows or Linux in my project can access these this uh, uh, cloud volume as well. So um, in my LAFC edit folder, I've got all of my assets and all of my uh, Premiere project data. And I've got Premiere running. And you can see I've got uh, a, a fairly uh, straight, uh, straightforward uh, Prem Adobe Premiere project. And I've got uh, the ability to play and use standard JKL keys to uh, to play backwards and forwards. It's very responsive. All this data, by the way, is being read off of that uh, NetApp Cloud Filer off the P drive. So I can um, you know, do standard uh, editing uh, tasks inside uh, Premiere and I can get some pretty good uh, feedback here. I can basically change some of my edit cuts so that I can build this highlight reel, for example. And I get audio sync as well. Uh, uh, Teradici PC over IP supports what's called enhanced AV sync, which will make sure that uh, the audio and the video are locked uh, and accommodate for different uh, bandwidths and uh, changes in your internet connectivity and your bandwidth uh, as bandwidth changes, it can adapt. It's also uh, ideal for working with things like lip sync and, uh, and, and other sort of audio specific audio uh, sync sensitive workloads. So, um, and again, I'm running it uh, a single monitor at HD resolution. Uh, Teradici also supports multiple monitors and multiple resolutions uh, up to 4K uh, and beyond, depending on what your settings are like and what kind of bandwidth you have available to you. I wanna upload some additional footage to this highlight reel uh, from a different game. And that footage happens to be on my local workstation on my Mac. So I'm going to hide the PC over IP client. I don't need to disconnect to do this. Uh, and I'm gonna go back to my Mac desktop and I'm gonna use a combination of a couple different things. Here I've got, uh, in this folder here, I've got uh, some footage of Diego Rossi scoring a goal at a different game. And I wanna use this as sort of a picture in picture uh, as part of the highlight reel. So I'm gonna use a combination of a couple different tools. There's this IBM Aspera drive, which will allow me to upload this file directly to a uh, Google Cloud storage bucket. And Aspera has uh, some pretty uh, some pretty interesting proprietary technology that maximizes your available bandwidth. So uh, from home, I only have a, maybe a 40 or a 50 megabit upload. If you have an enterprise grade connection with gigabit connection or 10 gig uplink, you can be uploading and streaming 
uh, many, many uh, gigabytes per second to your, uh, to your cloud project. So I have IBM Aspera Drive set up and I also am using a combination of Google Cloud PubSub and uh, cloud storage notifications to move that file once it's in the bucket to move it into the projects folder uh, into a specific uh, location in the project. So all I have to do is drag and drop onto IBM Aspera Drive and it will perform the synchronization uh, and you could see it's using 30 megabits. Uh, at, it's not a, that big of a file. I'm going to go back to my PC over IP client and uh, application, and I'm going to go into my footage transfer directory. And there it is. It was transferred uh, almost instantly. So, um, so now it's available for me to use in my in my edit. And I can just drag that into my timeline or into my uh, edit project. And I'm going to make a little bit more space here. So there's a point at the game where he uh, misses a shot. Here he is. So I want to maybe put a little picture in picture uh, of that earlier game, of that earlier goal down here. So I'm going to just plunk that into my timeline, make this a little taller, and we can zoom in a little bit. And we can scale this guy, scale this down maybe, and put it up in the corner. There we go. So, so now I've just taken some footage uh, from my local workstation, which could be, uh, it doesn't need to be on my local workstation. It could be on an on-prem uh, uh, ingestion service. Uh, these files can be auto-synchronized uh, to and from the NetApp file uh, cloud volume. And I've dropped it into my project here. So, so now what I want to do is some motion graphics to overlay on top of this to give maybe some stats about Rossi. Uh, and I'm going to bring in my colleague, Buzz Hayes, to, uh, to collaborate with. Uh, but first, I want to maybe give him some direction. I'm going to switch to uh, Adobe Photoshop, and I'm going to uh, maybe sketch over top of this, uh, this, this layout here so that I can give him some guidance. And to do that, I'm going to use a Wacom Cintiq tablet that is also attached to this virtual workstation. One of the cool things about PC over IP and the software itself is that it can span multiple desktops and multiple monitors. So in this case, I've got Photoshop running. So uh, same Adobe Creative Cloud suite of tools. But I've got Photoshop running not on, on my Mac, but on a Wacom tablet that's attached to my Mac uh, via USB um, and HDMI out. So this is a Wacom Cintiq uh, HD24, which is monitor and tablet combined. And um, I'm able to uh, use it as an input device with pressure sensitivity. Um, and what I'm going to do is take this still image, uh, the screen grab of, uh, of the, the point uh, of the edit where we want to bring up some highlights for uh, Diego Rossi's uh, uh, goal, or sorry, his lack of goal in this case. And I want to uh, indicate some, uh, some on-screen graphics to send uh, as a guide for Buzz to work, to work with. So I'm just going to add a couple uh, input points. There's uh, put an arrow in to indicate the direction that that element should come on. Uh, and then maybe have some stats on screen um, to show things like, uh, you know, lifetime goals or career goals or, or, uh, or, or season goals and things like that. Maybe a little uh, image or photo of Rossi comes up. And I'm doing this all on, on the tablet, which is attached to the same virtual workstation uh, and uh, all able to read and write from the same shared file system. So um, I'm going to be able to send this over to Buzz pretty easily. And just maybe I'll throw in some arrows to indicate the direction that these elements should come on screen. And uh, you'll notice I've got full pressure sensitivity. Um, and uh, maybe I'll just indicate that this comes on from the screen right and goes off on screen right. So at this point, I can just save this off as a, as a PNG file with an alpha channel and send that over to Buzz for, uh, to use as a guide. And I just wanted to be able to communicate to him my thoughts on uh, where these elements should sit. So, uh, Buzz, let's uh, let's have a look at this uh, in After Effects. Thank you, Adrian. So, uh, what I have here is uh, another VM that's set up. It's on the same network and it is connected to the same shared file storage as Adrian. So, we have both have access to all of the elements that are required for this project. In this case, I'm going to be using After Effects um, to pull together uh, various elements to be able to create a motion graphic overlay that Adrian can use in the edit in Premiere. 
Um, now, as part of that, I'm going to be using his reference. So as you saw a moment ago, uh, he created a reference here. Um, this gives us some indication as to what should be on the screen and where it should be. I like to do a quick comp typically just to see where things fall on the screen, just to make sure I'm not blocking anything in the background. So I'm going to comp it really quickly over a still frame of that section of the video. So you can see the picture in picture video up here in the right corner. And then uh, we have a, a text element here which says date, but I think uh, making a creative decision, I'm going to change that to the player's name. Um, We've got some indications as to how these elements are moving in. We also have a stats card here that'll appear at the bottom and uh, it will have an image of the player itself. There's some uh, indications here of motion. Uh, sometimes you have to make the decisions of the motion based on the actual underlying footage because you'll run into situations where the motion graphic might block an important part of the frame depending on where the camera is or where the subject of interest is in the frame. So sometimes we have to make creative decisions. And in this case, the underlying shot is not long enough really to be able to allow this graphic element to move all the way across the frame and still be readable. So I've made an executive decision to uh, have a different transition on that, which you'll see in just a moment. So um, you can see in this graphics elements folder, I've, uh, I've got a number of graphics elements here. Uh, one of them is uh, this uh, logo from the LAFC that we're going to use. We also have a headshot of uh, Diego Rossi. And here's the element that I created in Cinema 4D. So this is a video of the picture in picture piece of it. And it's basically been rendered into this frame. Um, and I've also included the player's name below the frame. And if you notice, there's a subtle light glint that's happening across there, especially in this section here, you'll see a light glint. This is just to give the graphic itself some life uh, when it's on the frame so it doesn't look too static. Uh, but this will be an element that is used to uh, bring in that picture in picture. And anything you see that's black here in the frame is actually going to be transparent in the final composite. That's important uh, so that it looks nice and clean when you put it together. So I've pre-built a sequence here that has all of these elements in it. Um, as you can see here in the layer side of things, I've got a number of text elements that are uh, native text within After Effects. I have the, the logo that we mentioned a minute ago from the LAFC. Uh, and then I have the headshot of the player. I have a couple of shapes here, which I'll show you in a second. And then I have the, at the bottom here, I have the uh, motion graphics element. So as I play this, uh, in slow-mo here, I'll just drag through the timeline. You'll notice as it comes in, it looks a little bit blurry. Uh, that's because I've added motion blur to it. Uh, because we're dealing with video frame rates, sometimes uh, motion graphics look a little stuttery or jittery. So the best way to counteract that is to enable uh, motion blur. And so if you look over here in the timeline, there's a little uh, in indicator here, which uh, is the motion blur setting. And it essentially uh, emulates what a camera shutter would do. Um, so there's a, a natural motion blur that happens in uh, in normal cameras. So this is emulating that. So if I've, I've turned this on for all the layers because basically all the layers are moving at some point. So that will give them a nice smooth motion. So as you can see, again, as it moves in, you see the leading edge is a little bit blurred. And then as this graphic element at the bottom, this is the change I made where it's rotating in now instead of sliding in, it has a little bit of motion blur right there at the beginning as it comes in and then it settles so it's in nice sharp focus. So now that all these elements are together uh, and uh, the timing seems to fit well, now what I'm going to do is take this particular element and I'm going to render it out. Uh, I'm going to add it to the render queue. In this case, I'm not going to use the Adobe Media Encoder uh, render queue, which I could do because that's on another VM that uh, Adrian has set up on this network. But this is such a small render, it's actually very quick to do right here on the machine. So here uh, I'm going to set an output format of QuickTime. And under format, I'm going to choose the uh, Apple ProRes 4444 format. And the reason for that is because the ProRes, uh, not all the for ProRes formats support alpha channels. Again, alpha channels are the uh, ability to present this area around the graphics as transparent. Um, if I were to render this in the other ProRes uh, codecs that don't support alpha channels, this would just come out as a giant black rectangle with these elements in it. And when I bring it into Premiere, it would obscure the video from underneath. So as long as I've chosen alpha channel here, then uh, I will have this nice transparent background. This particular clip has no audio, so I'm just gonna turn that off. And uh, 
the output file name is set down here. We're all ready to go. You can see how quick the render goes. It's going to play it in real time here as it renders because again, it's a very quick render. Now, if I were doing a lot of renders, if I had a pile of motion graphics that I was going to be doing, then I would most likely be taking all of these renders out to the media encoder so that I could keep working. Uh, by using the local queue here in After Effects, I'm tying up the application itself so I can't keep working. But if I were to send it off to the render queue, I could keep working. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Adrian so he can take this clip uh, that we just generated as an overlay graphic and drop it into his edit on Premiere. So thank you and take it away, Adrian. Thanks, Buzz. I'm going to take those graphics that you output and drag them into my timeline. And uh, because they're on the shared file system, we could both see the same files and the same assets. So I can just go to that directory and grab it from the output location. I'm going to pop that in. There's the footage. It's ready to go. So I'm ready to render this. And there's a few different ways to render Adobe Premiere projects. Uh, I could render it locally on my workstation, but I can also farm it off to a separate node. And I've got this separate node running Adobe Media Encoder in my same project. And I could see that here. I've got another piece of RP client running. Um, so I've got it ready to go and it's watching a watch folder. It's looking at uh, the media encoder transcoder folder. So um, any file that gets saved into there will get uh, automatically transcoded. So I'm going to save a copy into that location. I've got it here on my sidebar and save a copy there. So when I go back and watch Media Encoder, you can see it automatically picks up that render job. And it's going to run a number of different formats out. So I've got things like YouTube 1080p and a low res proxy, uh, some other output formats here as well. So uh, once that's done, we can uh, it's gonna write the final output to that same folder, but in the outputs folder. And we can go and uh, look at the results uh, on, on our workstation and view the final renders in real time with a frame viewer. So I can go into the transcoder folder here and go into output. And then let's look at maybe one of the YouTube 1080p files here. This is the latest one here. I'm going to open it with DJV, which is an open source frame viewer. And there it is. There's our final, uh, final render. So uh, maybe look over here. There's, there's the graphics that we added. Oh, let's go back and watch them come on. There they go. So there's the graphics that we added. So now that we've got all of our assets written to disk and we've got the different formats written out, uh, we could continue our workflow by uh, exporting these for to Object Store uh, to connect to a CDN with one of our CDN partners. You could run them through any number of machine learning APIs to uh, understand them better and be able to tag them and monetize them properly. Uh, and, uh, and that's there's a lot of partner technology as well that we can use uh, to feed these to a, a media asset management system, for example. Let's look at what we saw as part of this demo. I logged in through Active Directory using multi-factor authentication. I went in through a connection broker. The connection broker realized I was in Los Angeles and connected me to my workstation in Los Angeles. I was able to edit some footage using Adobe Premiere Pro uh, with full interactivity and very low latency. Uh, I was also able to draw on this tablet and draw some notes for Buzz. I handed those files over to Buzz uh, over our shared file system, where Buzz accessed his own virtual workstation in a similar manner, performed activities, and then saved that data back for me to grab. And then finally, I rendered the content on a separate machine that is operating as my media encoder server, uh, watching a watch directory. And then I was able to finally take the output video, view that, scrub through it, to verify that it was okay. And all that was streaming over Teradici PC over IP uh, with uh, full video quality on, uh, on the, for example, on this 2K monitor uh, with also my Cintiq tablet attached. So what we didn't have time to show as part of this demo is a, a more advanced ingestion strategy. You did see me use a spare drive to drag that file uh, and upload it automatically and put that on the NetApp cloud volume, but if you have massive amounts of data, for example, you're on a, on a set and you have terabytes of data to upload, you're going to need to define an asset uh, uh, ingestion strategy. And there's a bunch of technologies, both native and partner technologies on GCP to allow you to, to do that. We also didn't talk about things like disaster recovery uh, and asset management. Um, 
we, this our our workflow did not require an asset management system, but we have a lot of uh, ISVs, independent software vendors that we work with that provide asset managers. Um, there's also the notion of disaster recovery for moving, uh, allowing you to operate in any region in in, in your geographic location or in the world uh, as part of a, a contingency plan. Um, I want to bring Buzz in to talk a little bit further about how to monetize and uh, get more out of your archive using something called intelligent content discovery. Buzz? Thanks, Adrian. So yes, with intelligent content discovery, you know, you hear a lot about uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence tools that can uh, automatically derive metadata, both on the visual content and the audio content in files. But how we use that metadata is really important, uh, especially when it comes to monetizing the content itself. So uh, obviously the metadata is important when we're trying to find the content while we're still working with it, while we're producing the finished goods. But there's also, um, it's important to note that the, the metadata comes into play when it, you're actually trying to leverage the finished goods. So for example, in the use of recommendation engines or personalization, uh, artificial intelligence tools uh, that are leveraging this metadata can actually be very effective in the distribution side of things, um, as well as in the effort to be able to create new assets from the existing. So for example, if you're making trailers or teasers or things like that, they can be tailored to a very specific demographic using uh, AI, for example, uh, or at least the metadata that's associated with this content. So you can have a very tailored view of the content as we get closer and closer to this direct consumer world. And then in terms of the regionalization, obviously, as we deliver assets these days, it used to be that there was a time delay between the North American release of something and the European or worldwide release. Now they tend to be day and date, which means that all of the different versions, and there can be literally thousands of versions, have to be deployed at the same time. So there has to be some automation involved in creating these localized versions, as well as in uh, how this uh, the entire process of localization happens and where that happens. So uh, as Adrian mentioned before, we have a fairly extensive ecosystem of partners and our partners cover everything from the production side to content management, uh, the content distribution, as well as the consumer goods uh, services and management of the, the resources themselves. Um, as you can see here, we have partners from all over the place and this list is ever growing. But uh, all of these become very important factors when you're looking at a virtual studio deployment or a virtual post-production suite, because many of these folks have already deployed cloud native versions of their software, or they're working on cloud native versions, or their existing versions can actually work on cloud-based VMs. So it's important to note that we have this very extensive network. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention today. If you want to learn anything more about our media solutions, please visit our website, as you see here. Uh, there's plenty of information there for you to have, and you're also welcome to talk to our Google sales team. Um, but with that, I would like to thank on behalf of Adrian and myself, thank you all for your time and uh, go out there and build your own virtual post-production suite. Thank you.